and now look to Vern Shatty, Sponsorship Officer, Christchurch, to open the case for the opposition. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. And thank you in particular for giving me, a man, a platform to speak in this feminism debate. I do think, however, that this debate is linked intrinsically to the role men play within feminism and the wider campaign for gender equality. Feminism has long been associated with men giving up power or ceding control over institutions against their own interests. But I don't believe that feminism in today's capitalist system works like this. In today's highly individualistic and profit-driven society, the task given to feminists is to give women enough agency and power to tap into their own profit-making ability. Whether this be by putting safety measures in place to at work to prevent sexual abuse, getting rid of tampon taxes, or granting women the right to a safe and legal abortion, such measures help women participate in the capitalist system which the proposition is so adeptly criticizing. In a society where women have the ability to create profit, therefore, it's in men's individual interests to engage both with women and the campaign for gender equality, to redress the imbalances in capitalism's current form. My first point tonight, therefore, is that capital capitalism has been good for feminism. And, that the and for the condition of women around the world. If capitalism is a system where people are driven by profit, surely society, at least in theory, surely it isn't in anyone's interest for 50% of the world's population to be suppressed and their potential to be untapped. Although, very evidently, this isn't the case in practice, this is where feminism comes into play. This brings me on to my second point, that feminism can work to redress the power imbalances that exist within today's capitalist macrostructures. Feminism was born out of capitalism, within societies where women's first desires were neither social nor political, but economic. I will show, therefore, that much of the progress made by feminism has been very compatible with capitalism, and that future progress is too. My third and final point is a step back from the motion and to look at what it implies. In arguing that feminism cannot be capitalist, the proposition are arguing that fe being a feminist forces you to place yourself on the left, departing from the traditional view of, fem of feminism as an ideology that sits above the political spectrum, which should be accepted by all. More dangerously, perhaps, the motion is telling women to curtail their ambition, trying to dictate how successful they can and should aspire to be. by making them feel guilt for experiencing the same success as men. Before I continue, however, it falls upon me to introduce the proposition speakers tonight. You've just heard from Tamsin Lent, a first-year English student at St. Peter's College and a standout member of Secretary's Committee. While Tamsin has decried capitalist feminism tonight, what she hasn't told you is that she too was a victim of capitalist feminism when she paid four pounds every month for Kylie Jenner's app, Kylie. <laughs> this gave her access to makeup tutorials, Kylie's outfits, Kylie's favorite artists, and of course, the Kardashian-Jenner livestream. <laughs> second is Louisa Berg, a second year PPEist at Wadham College and director of press at the Union. I recently found out that in Louise's pastime, she coaches the German school debating team. Well, so you'll have to forgive her if her arguments put you to sleep tonight. <laughs> Finally, we have Dr. Nicole Ashef, sociologist, writer, and author of The New Profits of Capital, which challenges the assumptions of capitalist society, going as far as to ch challenge the public's love of Oprah. I think I can safely say that this won't be winning her many supporters tonight. Madam President, these are your guests, and they are most welcome. <laughs> Capitalism is, therefore, at least in theory, a system where private owners of business and property are driven only by profit. If we take today's high-competitive, cutthroat, globalised economy to be the most reflective of this theorised version of capitalism that we've ever seen, 
then no wonder that today's women are the freest and most equal than ever before. As we've moved away from feudal modes of production, dismantling hierarchies based around male primogeniture, capital has come to realize the wasted potential in having 50% of the population not participating in the economy. The McKinsey report, Diversity Matters, revealed that for every 10% increase in gender diversity in business, there's a 3.5% increase in profit. We don't need an MBA to understand that employees want the best person for the job, regardless of their gender. And, shock horror, sometimes that person's a woman. Through the process of industrialization and the experience of war, in the West we have reached a, a situation where, a position where 70% of women are working and the rates of men and women in higher education are equal. Within this population of working women, some have had extraordinary le le levels of success. Ginny Romity, CEO of IBM, controls a company worth over 140 billion pounds. Zhou Kenfei, born in a small village in Hunan province, China, and founder of Lens Technology, is now worth a whopping $6 billion. The break the glass ceiling metaphor may be an overused one, but that doesn't make it any less potent. Even though these women lie at the very extreme of society, they reflect the scale of accomplishment of women within capitalist society, and these women who have managed to make capitalism work for them, something which wouldn't have been possible very long ago. While you've heard from Tamsin that capitalism benefits only the top 1% of women, even if we take a look at the other extreme, we can see that capitalism and the desire to work for profit has helped women lead their families out of poverty in developing nations. It is the entrepreneurial spirit of women, working in the informal sector, setting up small businesses, but learning to be conscious of how they spend their money, which has brought millions out of poverty. Self-employed women, with control of their earnings, have the ability to make decisions themselves about how to spend their money. Instead of being dependent on a small proportion of their husband's earnings, they're given the agency to spend money as they choose from their children's schooling, education, clothes and food. The Grameen Bank, founded in 1983 by Mohammed Yunus, is a microfinance organization which has provided over $29 billion in loans to poor borrowers without requiring collateral. Yunus credits the success of his organization, which brought him a Nobel Peace Prize in 2006, with an approach which doesn't base itself on handouts and grants to women, but a system where individuals feel an impetus to pay back loans and keep themselves eligible for future ones. Both the bank and the individual women, therefore, are acting in the interests of capital and profit within a capitalist framework, and it is this which has led to increased inequality in these areas. These examples of capitalism being good for feminism are evident. But it's also important to note that sexism can exist without capitalism, and that communism and socialism haven't proven themselves to be better systems for tackling gender inequality whatsoever. It's something that Eunice touches on when he, when he criticizes a system of handouts to poor women and expecting this to miraculously bring them out of poverty. Creating a system, a bureaucracy run by men, in which individual agency is minimized gives little hope for feminism and little scope for it to act. In a system where it's in men's interest to monopolize capital and they have the power and the ability to do so, women and feminism are stuck. This brings me to my second point, that feminism works best in a capitalist society and is needed to the redress the balances in the current system. To argue that today's form of capitalism is ideal for women would be ludicrous and that all women have the agency to reach out and grab it if they choose arguing that women choose to enter prostitution and accept depressed wages in menial jobs of their own volition is ignorant. And it's clear that even in a supposedly capitalist society, those in power are often motivated by things other than profit and have their judgment clouded by prejudice. However, feminism has done a lot to make capitalist structures work for women within the current system. These are women working within the current system to break it. In September 2009, feminist city workers joined forces with the Fawcett Society to fight the encroachment of the sex industry into their working lives. In January 2013, Cheryl Sandberg set up LeanIn.org, a website which enables successful businesswomen to help other women achieve their goals. In June 2019, the International Labour Organization, at the behest of feminist NGOs, 
adopted a treaty to establish global standards on workplace violence and harassment. These are all private initiatives undertaken by individual groups of women to make capitalism work for them. They don't want to see their fellow women working in oppressive conditions, feel unwelcome in the workforce, or uncomfortable due to the sexualization of business. And so they've decided to do something about it. I see the Me Too movement in a very similar light. Yes, the old system was warped and weighted in favor of men who had the power and the ability to, to exploit women beneath them in the pecking order. But it wasn't capitalism's fault. It was the men who felt like they were untouchable. A boys' club where it was in everyone's interest to keep women out and not, let, and not speak out. Today, however, with more women in the workplace and in positions of power, and with more women with the financial capabilities to press charges against abusers, women are gaining back their agency and are using capitalism to do so. The rise of women taking control of capitalist power structures has been helped by government legislation, giving women control of their own baby-making capacity, paid maternity leave, and moving towards a system where two working parents is the norm gives women the ability to make choices about work, fertility, and family life. Such measures show how women can work with capitalism to make capitalism work for women. So if women can make capitalism work for them, why should their feminism, their desire for equal rights, force them to oppose the system? According to the motion at hand, feminism isn't pure or true unless it opposes the entire system. This is a dangerous road for feminism to go down. It gives feminism its place on the political spectrum, neatly placed as, a, as another left-wing ideology rather than the universal one it should aspire to be. We lose the ability to expect our leaders to be feminists, to expect our constitution to be feminist, once we start to tie it to a complete overhaul of the system. Both a large number of conservative women and a large number of conservative men who've benefited from capitalist structures but would still regard themselves as feminists today would feel excluded. Those who believe in the importance of equality of opportunity for women and men but not in obtaining equality of outcome would also feel excluded. A desire to look at the economic implications of every issue would mean feminists who believe in a political, rights-based form of feminism, issues such as widening access to education, to birth control, and giving women the same freedom of movement and expression as men would feel excluded. This fundamentally comes back to whether or not one's feminism should dictate one's wider political opinions. How can feminists tell other women where they ought to lie on the political spectrum? How can women be forced to accept a feminism which destroys the structures that have helped them in the past, structures which they see as having changed to give women more agency and more ability to harness their own potential? <coughs> Finally, capitalism is today's status quo and a system which isn't going anywhere for the foreseeable future. The left in the West have to some extent accepted this and committed themselves to finding a more palatable form of capitalism based around the principles of equality of opportunity and meritocracy. A vote in favour of the motion today, therefore, is a vote of pessimism, that we can't make today's system work in the interests of gender equality, that the feminist ideal is unattainable without structural overhaul, and that the work of feminists within capital stru capitalist structures is futile. Therefore, in voting that feminism can be capitalist, we are voting with confidence, and with hope in the ability of capitalism to be good for feminism and the ability of feminism to work to improve capitalism in today's world and tomorrow's. Thank you.